Welcome to this introduction and overview video for the book of Ecclesiastes and the Old Testament. Over the next few months, we're going to be digging deeply into this book. And I hope that this video will just give you some tools to use to help us to understand this book uh, rightly. It really is an important book for us to get our heads around in the world that we live in. Uh, this book, for those who have read it, will know this repeated word in the book, meaningless. It's used 38 times, the Hebrew word Havel. And we'll look more deeply at that word in a moment. Uh, but the important thing to grab hold of in this book, although he starts with this word meaningless, what the teacher wants us to see as we go through the whole book is that if you truly want to live a meaningful rather than a meaningless life, if you truly want to live a meaningful life that enjoys God's gifts rather than living a, may, a vain, empty life, then there's only one way to do that. If you want to live a meaningful life, then you need to live in the fear of God. And this is where the tool of just looking at the beginning and the end of a book is a really important tool. So here are the opening words of the book and the closing words of the book of Ecclesiastes. And you see some uh, key overlap. We've got this meaningless, meaningless, as the teacher says here, and it ends again. Uh, chapter 12, verse 8, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. So he's gone through 12 chapters of a book and he seems to end in the same place. Everything is just meaningless. But then very importantly, at the end of the book, we have these words. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion. Mr. Teacher, the teacher has come to a conclusion after looking at all of these things under the sun and he says, here's the conclusion, fear God and keep his commands. For this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. So Mr. Teacher wants us to fear God. Fear God so that you can turn the meaninglessness of life, this vain, empty life, if you want to turn life into something meaningful, which truly enjoys God's gifts, then fear God. And that's something that we need to hold tightly to as we go on this journey through the book of Ecclesiastes. This book is not meant to drive us to despair. It's actually meant to drive us to God to not just live with a horizontal perspective, looking at life under the sun. Don't just observe life as one living on this globe under the sun. We need to lift our eyes and look to the God who made everything under the sun. And we need his wisdom so that we will live a life that isn't meaningless, but rather that we will live a wise life enjoying the gifts that God gives us in this world under the sun, all in the fear of God. Now, if we are to think a little bit about structure in the book, um, I've been helped by a man called Sidney Graydarnas in reading just some of his observations about this book. And he shows that after this uh, introductory uh, section, from chapter 1 verse 12, all the way through to chapter 6, verse 9, uh, we are given kind of the first half of the book. So from chapter 1, verse 12 to 6, verse 9, uh, gives us the first half of the book. And it really is answering this key question here. I wanted to see what was good for people to do. Uh, what is good for man to do in this life under the sun? And throughout this opening section, we get this repeated phrase, it's chasing after the wind. It's like chasing after the wind. But here in verse, chapter 6, verse 9, it's the last time that uh, we see this phrase used in the book. So what is good for man to do? Um, he, he says, well, it all just feels like we're chasing the wind. And it all feels rather meaningless. So he, he tries many things. He tries to have fun and he tries to work really hard and he tries to make lots of money and tries to pursue pleasure. All of these things that he pursues, he finds that they're ultimately 
meaningless if we're trying to find meaning in these things under the sun, which then brings us back to the end of the book, where actually if you want to enjoy these things properly, you need to fear God and keep his commandments. And so the second half of the book uh, starts in chapter 6, verse 10, all the way through to uh, chapter 11, verse 6. So just before uh, he finally wraps up the book. So 6, verse 10 to 11, verse 6. And the key question that is asked in this second half of the book is over here for who knows what is good for a person to do during this life. So he's saying, what is good for a person to do? And who knows the future? What's going to happen after we're gone? So the question in the first half is, what is good for man to do? And the second half is, well, who knows? Who really knows what is good for man to do? Who knows the future? And that's kind of the question that he's pondering in the second half, just trying to find meaning under the sun. But then after that, we get where he, he wraps up uh, his book and finally gets to this point at the end where he says, well, this is the conclusion. Fear God and keep his commands. If you truly want to live a meaningful life that enjoys God's gifts rather than living a vain, empty life, there's only one way. Live in the fear of God. And that's one of the big things that we will dig into, trying to work out exactly what does it mean to live in the fear of God. Now, if you haven't already done so, uh, with these inter introductory comments in mind, I encourage you to take some time now to pause the video and actually go read the book. Go read through the whole of Ecclesiastes. It shouldn't take you too long. Uh, it's only 12 chapters. But as you go through, look out for repeated words or ideas like meaningless or under the sun, but then also look out for other repetition that you'll see. And looking out for repeated words in a book is a really important way to try and make sense of uh, why different books are written. And so I'm going to just uh, show some of the repetition uh, that I've uh, noticed in the book. So as I already said, he starts by saying the teacher, a son of David, he doesn't give his name. Some uh, say that they think it's Solomon. Others say that there's much in this book that seems to suggest that it's, it's later than Solomon because he's struggling to find meaning. It doesn't seem to fit so well with uh, that high point in Israel's history when Solomon was king. But the reality is he doesn't tell us. He doesn't give his name. He just speaks of himself as the teacher, the son of David. So in David's line, um, and he's trying to give us wisdom for life. And we see that repetition of uh, the teacher a few times in the book, not so much, but we see it uh, particularly beginning and end. So he's showing uh, he has tried to observe life under the sun and try to figure out how to make life not meaningless. Now, uh, this repetition of meaningless we see uh, throughout the book. So all the uh, highlights in blue here show everywhere where he's showing he's trying so many things, but he keeps coming to this point. It's, it's just meaningless. Meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Without meaning. This too is meaningless. That's the end of the first half. Second half continues. It's meaningless. Meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. And then he wraps up the book again, speaking about meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless, says the teacher. So you see a lot of repetition of that word meaningless, which, as I said, is the Hebrew word um, hevel, which meaningless is a little bit of a, a weak translation, but we struggle with English to find a better word. Another word that could be used is enigmatic. Uh, so it can't be grabbed hold of. You're trying to figure out the purpose of life and you can't quite get your hands on it. Um, and it's more that, that enigmatic, hard to grab hold of. It's like a mist. If you spray mist and you try to grab hold of it, it's just gone. Uh, that's kind of the sense behind this word meaningless. And yeah, so we need to 
think a bit more when we hear the word meaningless, it, it's, it's a bit more nuanced than just purely meaningless. Uh, another repetition we see throughout the book is this idea of life under the sun. So he's observing life um, horizontally. So all the orange highlights that you see as we go through here, it's all observing life under the sun, trying to make sense of life uh, from the perspective of those living in the world. And you see there's lots of repetition of this life under the sun. Whole lot again about life under the sun. So when you notice repetition like this in any book that you are looking at, you need to ask questions. What exactly is the author trying to show us about uh, this particular repetition and in this case about life under the sun. What does Mr. Teacher want us to know about life under the sun? And this is an observation of the world um, on a horizontal level, trying to look at things as they happen in this world and make sense of them. Another repetition that we see over and over again in the book is how Mr. Teacher talks about uh, what do people gain from their labors at which they toil. So just the reality of living in a, a world under the sun that's cursed. We we're told in uh, Genesis that since the fall, work is under the curse. So we toil, it's hard work. And you see a whole lot of uh, repetition of this labor work. And again, you can go through the whole book and have a look at what, what he says about um, the reality that work is difficult, it's toil, toilsome labor, uh, work under the sun is, is hard. And so again, you can go through the whole book and look for repetition of toil and labor. Um, just to say on the, uh, there's a, a free program available on the internet called The Step Bible, S-T-E-P Bible, and it, it's got great tools just to help you see this type of repetition in a book. So I commend that um, tool to you just to see repetition and try and see big uh, themes jumping out of a book. Uh, so that is The Step Bible. Um, now, as I said, this idea of chasing the wind, it's only used in the first half of Ecclesiastes. Uh, so everything in yellow here in the first half, and you see he says a lot. And you think about the idea of chasing the wind. Um, for us living in Tableview in Cape Town, we know all about the wind, and we know that you can't really catch it. Uh, so the pursuit of chasing the wind would be absolutely meaningless, pointless. And that's how the first half ends. Kind of, it just, it just feels like pointless. Uh, you can't actually ever catch the wind. And so that's an important repeated theme. Again, uh, through the first half of the book. And then there's a whole lot. This is wisdom literature. So in the Bible, we've got important wisdom books. You've got the book of Proverbs, which is much more kind of black and white. Um, if you do this, this will happen. The book of Ecclesiastes uh, is showing that life's not actually that neat. Um, the wisdom that we need to live under the sun will show us that things don't always turn out as you would hope. And that's the wisdom that we see um, here in this world. But although things don't always uh, turn out as we would hope, which can make us feel like life is meaningless or chasing the sun, the writer does want us to enjoy God's good gifts and to enjoy them God's way, enjoying them as we fear God and see them as good gifts from him. So this idea of wisdom, again, it comes the whole way through. So all the highlights in pink, um, you'll see. What does it mean to be wise or foolish? So you see this contrast between uh, wisdom and folly uh, coming also through the book. Uh, so you've got also wisdom, wise or knowledge. Uh, I grouped those words together. Uh, so it's not, you're not just looking for the word wisdom, but also wise or uh, knowledge, which are repeated throughout the book. So you've got knowledge again and wisdom. So again, go through the whole book 
look for this uh, key repetition um, of wisdom or folly, uh, those who are, are fools, who aren't living God's way under the sun. And then also you see a whole lot of repetition. Now I'm working in the NIV here and the NIV doesn't consistently translate this word here. It's actually the word heart in the Hebrew. So I applied my heart to study. I said to my heart, look, I've increased in wisdom more than anyone who ruled over Jerusalem before me and my heart and my heart have experienced much wisdom. Um, so there's this whole repetition. So if you go, as, as I go through, you'll see just all of these hearts just to show us. Um, it, it's a deep, uh, deep uh, heart experience of life that he's talking about uh, throughout this book. And we see that repetition over and over again. Uh, we also see uh, some repetition of this idea of pursuit of pleasure. So as you go through, look for these repeated ideas uh, to try and make sense of, of what he's trying to show us. It's just the pursuit of pleasure is like chasing the wind. Uh, you're not going to find ultimate meaning in pleasure. You're not going to find ultimate meaning in work. You're not going to find ultimate meaning in anything under the sun. If you want to enjoy these things, though, then fear God. Now, another very important repetition that we'll see throughout the book are what some people call the carpe diem statements. And there are seven of them through the book. So they are I've put a green block around them. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. So it's kind of carpe diem, uh, seize the day, make the most of this life under the sun. And we see a number of these seize the day passages. So I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in their toil. This is a gift of God. So again, it's a godly perspective on the way we live, eating and drinking and finding satisfaction in our work. If you can truly be happy and enjoy it, that's a gift from God. And he's saying seize the day, but seize the day not in an earthly sense, just to try and find meaning in eating and drinking and work, but seize the day as God wants you to really enjoy life under the sun. So we see over and over again these seize the day phrases, and they are important for us to just think carefully about. Uh, again here, what I've, this is what I've observed to be good, that it is appropriate for a person to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life that God has given them. Um, again, just a seize the day uh, passage. Another one here in chapter 8. Seize the day. There's nothing better for a person under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad during these days of life that God has given them under the sun. So it's... The days that God has given them is just showing that acknowledgement that uh, this life under the sun is a gift from God. Another one, chapter 9, go seize the day, uh, make the most of this life under the sun, uh, see it as a gift from God. And then the final one here in chapter 11, kind of seize the day, uh, enjoy life while you're young and there's an interesting contrast between um, enjoying seizing the day while you're young and then this picture that we're given of old age uh, the picture is like a house kind of breaking down coming towards the end of life uh, but the teacher is giving us god's wisdom saying seize the day make the most of life under the sun uh, see that from a perspective of those under the sun, everything can appear meaningless. But if you live in the fear of God, then you can seize the day. You really can enjoy the good gifts that God has given us. And so look out for those uh, carpe diem repetitions as you go through. We do need to ask, though, um, how, how is this 
a Christian book. It could just appear like it's wisdom from God, but if we hold that the whole Bible finds its fulfillment and climax in Jesus, then how does Ecclesiastes fit into that? And that's going to be hard work to uh, see that through this book because there's no clear um, passages in here that point us to the cross in some way. Um, but there are important things that we can see as we, as we go through where Jesus takes uh, wisdom from a book like Ecclesiastes and applies it. So do not store up for yourself treasures on earth. Um, is very much saying a similar thing uh, to what uh, we see in this early chapter uh, in Ecclesiastes. And he says, I hated the things I do, uh, for I toiled for under the sun. Uh, but then we hear Paul saying in 1 Corinthians 15, in the light of the resurrected Jesus, in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So if you see this toiling under the sun from God's perspective in the Lord, then you'll realize actually that labor is not in vain. And actually you'll work even harder in the fear of God for the glory of God. But as we're thinking about this idea of wisdom, uh, also at the beginning of 1 Corinthians, we are told that Jesus Christ personified wisdom. He was wisdom with skin on, the wisdom of God. And uh, he taught people wisdom as we think of Matthew's gospel, where the people said that he was like one having authority. He taught with God's wisdom. And so throughout this book, we need to think about how these truths are helping us as Christians to read the Old Testament, to read this Old Testament wisdom through the lens of the, the life, uh, the teaching, the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. And so that's going to be a very important part of our journey through uh, this book of Ecclesiastes because that is going to show us ultimately how life is not meaningless. Because only those who find true life and meaning in Jesus will be able to really enjoy God's gifts and so won't just live a vain, empty life here under the sun, but will live a meaningful life, enjoying God's gifts, living in the fear of God, and seeing that actually Jesus is wisdom, God with skin on. He is the one who we should fear, and he is the one who will teach us how to live life rightly. And so I really do encourage you, take the time to pray, and ask God to help you to understand his word. Take the time to read through this book uh, a few times over the, the next weeks and pray that God would open your eyes to see these big important truths about how to live under the sun and remembering that if you truly want to live not a meaningless but a meaningful life that really enjoys uh, God's gifts, that enjoys work and enjoys pleasure and enjoys uh, food, uh, enjoying all God's gifts under the sun, if you truly want to do that, then the only way is to live in the fear of God. So just remembering again uh, this top and tailing of the, the whole book, uh, he starts with meaningless, he ends with meaningless but then he's got this conclusion, fear God and keep his commandments. That's the only way to live a meaningful life that enjoys the good things that God gives us. And truly fearing God is to trust in Jesus and to see that Jesus is wisdom with skin on, who, who teaches us how to live in God's world, God's way for God's glory. And so I hope that as we go through this book, it will indeed give us a big view of Jesus and help us to live wisely in this life under the sun in a way that isn't meaningless, but fearing God, living for his glory. So God bless as you dig into this great book further for yourself. And let's be in prayer that God would teach us great things about himself and how to live in his world for his glory.
God bless as you dig in further.